Uh, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. My name is Sandro Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome. And before we begin, a word of, a word, word, word of thanks to everybody who makes today happen, in particular Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel in the Dean's office. Thank you. The conditions that shape public health are constantly evolving. They include politics, social change, corporate practices, and acute challenges like the current COVID-19 pandemic. In this time of coronavirus, we have seen how public health intersects with issues of human rights and civil liberties on a population-wide scale. This context has made it especially important to have conversations about public health now, perhaps even more than ever. We are very fortunate to have at our school scholars who are deeply involved in shaping how public health law is practiced and taught. With the release of the newest edition of the casebook Public Health Law, these speakers have incorporated the latest advances and challenges into the presentation of foundational public health health law concepts. I am very much looking forward to hearing from them and learning from them today. In terms of the format, we are going to have a panel of our four uh, speakers. Uh, they will uh, each present for a little bit, have a conversation amongst themselves, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience, which I will moderate and direct to the speakers as appropriate. Uh, we will take questions after all four speakers have spoken. Um, very briefly, our four speakers in order are Professors Wendy Mariner, the Edward Utley Professor of Health Law, Ethics, and Human Rights, uh, Professor Michael Ulrich, who's Assistant Professor of Health Law, Ethics, and Human Rights, Professor Nicole Huberfeld, Professor of Health Law, Ethics, and Human Rights, and Professor George Annis, who is the William Furfield Warren Distinguished Professor of Health Law, Ethics, and Human Rights. All our distinguished faculty are also members of our Center for Law, Ethics, and Human Rights. I'm now going to turn it over first to Professor Mariner. Wendy. Thank you, Dean Galea, and thanks again to everyone who made this seminar possible and then scrambled to convert it into a live stream webinar. Um, today, Professors Annis Huberfeld and all have a conversation about law and ethics. The field of public health has grown up, and with it, public health law. It's not your great grandfather's field anymore. We wrote this third edition of the book uh, to offer a contemporary vision of the field of public health law, one that would be useful beyond today's headlines, one that lays out the role of law in public health are not just tools to implement specific public health goals, um, like prohibiting smoking in public places or closing businesses in the middle of a pandemic. The law establishes the country's system of governance and whether which either can improve health and safety or create risk to health and safety. So appreciating that um, is important to health policy. Putting together the chapters, we uh, found that four themes emerged that we believe are foundational to understanding public health law. So each of us is going to describe one of those themes. I will describe the first, what counts as a public health problem. Professor Ulrich will speak about the second, scope and limits of government power. Professor Huberfeld will speak about the many legal ways to solve legal problems. And last but hardly least, uh, Professor Annis will discuss fairness and justice, an essential element of it all. We'll spend about five minutes each discussing these and then, have, then the rest of us will have a conversation, perhaps providing illustrations and examples of these. Um, this is largely designed to alleviate the tedium of a single talking head talking for too long. So I'll begin with what counts as a public health problem? Well, it can be almost anything that affects the health and safety of a large number of people. The coronavirus is dominating the news now, and you can't think of a more classic public health issue. Consider the recent uh, federal stimulus bills that were passed simply to allow the country to survive during the uh, pandemic, the first $8.3 billion package provided funds to enable several federal agencies to act and develop vaccines and possible therapies and buy supplies for the strategic national stockpile. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act of March 18th and the CARES Act, Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security, uh, which Trump signed last Friday provides federal funding for some paid leave, uh, tax credits, COVID-19 testing, emergency fund assistance, expanded employment benefits, cash payments, some small business loans, 
I also temporarily suspend work requirements for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, uh, uh, you may know as food stamps, increase Medicaid funding and provide funds to states for in, incredibly needed supplies. These are all the kinds of laws that protect public health. People who are laid off or only get paid when they work still need to make rent and loan payments and buy groceries. Think of Uber drivers and, and freelancers. Small businesses may fold without customers and going bankrupt and getting evicted is not safe or healthy. So what counts as a risk to public health? Well, today, more than epidemics, we've eliminated or reduced many of the infectious disease threats, but we will face them again and again. Still, the major causes of death in the world today, and particularly in the United States, are non-communicable <coughs> conditions. Heart disease, cancers, chronic lower respiratory diseases, stroke, Alzheimer's disease. Meanwhile, well over 14,000 people die from uh, homicide with a firearm and more than almost 24,000 die from suicide using a gun. Uh, 38,000 more died in motor vehicle fatalities and between 44 and 98,000 die from medical errors. As Dean Galea emphasizes, uh, the fundamental causes of the premature deaths in this group is not a virus. Michael Marmot argues that at bottom it's poverty, but these, admit, these risks emerge from the basic structure and institutions of civil society, the social determinants of health. And it's the laws governing these institutions and the laws enacted by our legislators, state, federal, local, tribal, and the, and the decisions issued by our courts that make it more or less likely that people can survive and thrive. For example, laws that criminalize some drugs and grant patents to others. Laws that criminalize some medical procedures and not others. Laws that sale of firearms. Laws that regulate advertising. Laws that regulate workplace safety and employer relationships. Laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of traits like race, color, sex, or religion. Laws that require informed consent to medical care and research. Laws that protect personal information from being disclosed. And laws that allow others to access your personal information. Laws that find eligibility for Medicare and Medicaid to make it more or less possible for people to get health care. Laws that subsidize the production of corn, sugar, and meat instead of fresh fruits and vegetables, and thereby structure what food's available to us and at what price. So anyone interested in health policy should recognize that our legal system shapes our health system. We wrote this book to give everyone an opportunity to learn how that works. So I will open it up to conversation from my colleagues. Are we able to be heard now? Yeah, I think everybody can be heard. Wendy, I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about what it takes to define a public health problem. It feels a little on the nose during a pandemic, but this is a question that we try to answer quite a lot in our regular everyday conversations when there isn't a very obvious emergency occurring. So maybe we could address that for a minute. Feel free. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to raise some examples of, of this. One, uh, you know, one question is, you could say everything is a public health problem because so many things affect our health and safety in, in this country. But that's what, in fact, we need to recognize, that it's not just medicine. It's not just epidemics. It's not just immunizations. Um, but people either can be safe and healthy because of how they work and live. And how they work and live depends fundamentally on many laws that govern uh, whether they can work, how much they're paid, um, what their employers are uh, able to do and not do, whether they have sick leave, right? Um, whether they have time for their family. And this actually, in this pandemic, could um, have a, a rather remarkable shakeup in the way we think about those elements of our uh, social civil society. 
and how we can make it possible for people to uh, survive well. Yeah, I'll just say I, one of the things that I find interesting about this is the debate over whether or not um, we should or when we should open back up the society or the economy. And one of the things that is often discussed in that is not just whether it's important from a market perspective, but from a health perspective, um, with people saying things like, we could have more deaths ultimately from a failing economy than we might have from the virus, and so how to balance that out. And so I think it's interesting that now you have sort of a social determinants of health argument um, or perspective catching on and whether or not that will ultimately uh, survive past this epidemic. Anyone want to weigh in? Uh, that's, a, that's a difficult question. Certainly those um, in the field of public health recognize the importance of social determinants of health. And there are some who would think that, for example, all the federal stimulus bills are um, examples of things that we need to be doing all the time providing the kind of, of sick leave, making sure that people have job security, um, making sure we have supplies of necessary um, the medical supplies and the like, that we can ensure that we um, have well-equipped hospitals and the like. Uh, others might argue that because of the price, we may in fact fall back into a more stringent um, vision of society where companies decide they don't need as many workers. They can rely on automation more. They can rely on technology more. So this is an, an opportunity to really uh, struggle with those kinds of questions in public rather than solely within the field of public health. It seems to me a flip side to this conversation and one that we have when it's not, again, a public health emergency is the, the caution that we should exercise in defining everything as a public health problem, right? One issue that we've seen is that, for example, the uh, Supreme Court will say, oh, well, of course, every person who enters a jail needs to undergo a full body examination to ensure there's no contraband for the health of the prisoners. And of course, that isn't always what needs to happen. And so while we want to think about public health expansively, there's also reason to define public health cautiously at the same time. And that's a point that we try to make in the book as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Shall we move on with Professor Ulrich? Sure. Um, so the other, another uh, sort of theme and main point that we wanted to focus on was when you do identify a public health problem or one that is especially serious and affecting a large group of people, we typically want some sort of government action, right, to address that problem. And so one of the important questions then is one, can the government address it from a legal perspective? And then two, what inhibits or limits their authority to act um, under the auspices of this is uh, addressing a public health problem. And so the first thing is thinking about the authority and the reason why states typically uh, have primary jurisdiction for public health problems is that they have a much broader authority under the police powers to address any issues that deal with public health, safety and welfare. Um, but the federal government, though that often gets a lot more attention, has a much more limited authority to act in the name of public health. Um, and in fact, what they can do typically has to be tied into interstate commerce in some way, um, because their primary direct authority to regulate is under the Commerce Clause. Uh, they also have a broader power um, for spending, but that typically relies on state buy-in and state cooperation. So though they can use financial incentives to get states to do things that the feds can't do themselves, states don't always have to accept. And so you think about something like Medicaid and Medicaid expansion, right? Although they, uh, when the ACA was passed, they thought it was a considerably generous um, 
way to entice states to enroll and expand Medicaid, we still see that there are a number of states that ultimately haven't. And even the original Medicaid program, um, it took 17 years for the last state ultimately to decide to enroll. So um, the other thing is, uh, you know, you see this in terms of quarantine, right? And this has been discussed a lot recently um, in terms of what can the states do for quarantine? What can the feds do? Um, Trump just announced or, or mentioned in the speech um, this week or a few days ago that he was considering quarantining New York or Connecticut and parts of New Jersey. And whether or not they could actually do that, again, would is more limited than when the states can quarantine because again, the feds only have authority to quarantine in terms of its influence on interstate commerce, which typically then relies on people moving or potentially moving between states. Even if the government does have authority to regulate, the other thing that is obviously a big limitation are individual rights. Uh, we focus mostly in the book on constitutional rights um, because those are um, certainly important and, and create sort of a large barrier to government action. Um, but it's important to sort of identify how different rights are seen differently. Um, they aren't evaluated all the same. Some are more important or regarded by the judiciary as more important than others. And so that's an important thing that we also go through in the book is which rights create sort of stronger limitations on the government action than others. Um, but again, this is relevant now. So as states are limiting um, people in public, uh, they have the authority then to close down certain businesses that are not essential. But what is an essential business? Um, so we see now in some states there are people suing saying that because of the Second Amendment that gun stores and places where they could purchase ammunition are should be deemed essential. And so does do Second Amendment rights then limit the ability of the state to forcibly close down um, firearm stores? Uh, we see it also in terms of um, medical necessity. So some states have now said that you can't have abortions um, because they are not medically necessary. And so who gets to make these determinations? What limitation do individual rights play on, um, you know, sort of limiting what the government can do, even in cases right now where you have, um, you know, a broad emergency is really important. And one of the things that we really spend a lot of time uh, on the book. The other thing that I'll say is these are different distinctions, what can be done legally is not necessarily the same as what should be done. Um, and so that's another important part where the law and policy come together. Um, there are plenty of circumstances where the government maybe can act legally, but it might not be advisable. And so we see this again, and this is something that Professor Mariner and I have talked about with use of quarantine uh, quite a bit, even if the government can act, one of the things that's really critical in public health is public trust and public cooperation. And the more that you use coercive, sort of heavy-handed authoritarian style regulations, especially of people's liberties, the more damaging it can be to public trust and cooperation. And so even if something can be done, uh, public health creates a good lens of thinking through when and why maybe things should not be done necessarily. Um, also, there are situations where there are overlapping interests. Um, Professor Mariner mentioned um, the stimulus package, and that presents a, 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 an example of where even if the feds could maybe start quarantining people, really their role is probably best served in uh, complementing state action and providing financial stability for those people who, um, to make it more easy for them to, um, you know, take into consideration social distancing and things like that. So with that, I'll open it up. So I think one question on a lot of people's minds is um, if the federal government were to uh, decide that some kind of federal action on quarantine were necessary, uh, what would that look like? How far would it go? Um, is it even possible? And I, I think this is a, a heavy question. It's one that I've been asked a lot recently. 
I think it would be highly unusual for the federal government to quarantine the entire nation, but whether there could be an action such as quarantining a city like New York City, I actually think is much more possible. Uh, the population of New York City, of course, is greater than that of some states in the nation, um, and it is a commercial hub in the country. And I think that's something that maybe we should talk about for a moment because I'm getting a lot of questions about this sort of throughout this whole pandemic. Sure, I'll, I'll give an initial thought and then I, I know Professor Mariner um, uh, can, can add in anything that I maybe miss. The, the federal government has a much broader authority for quarantining people coming into the country. Um, and that obviously makes a lot more sense. People moving within the country, even interstate, we have argued in a paper that they, that the CDC, um, who has sort of got delegated authority, doesn't have as broad uh, authority to quarantine individuals. Quarantine meaning people that are suspected of being exposed but have not been confirmed to be, um, to be actually uh, infected. They have authority to quarantine or to isolate and to detain people that are uh, infected, but at least according to the statute, the Public Health Service Act, it mentions apprehension for people that are suspected. So there's a question about whether they could actually do a federal sort of uh, quarantine. There's another question of whether they should, and it's another thing that we argue that is probably best left to state authority. They have a better sense on the ground of the citizenry, um, the infections, um, people's habits and people's lifestyles, where threats are, because ultimately, again, when you're starting to think through issues of public trust and cooperation, it's better to keep involuntary quarantine, which is different than suggestions of social distancing, shelter in place, limit your exposure to being in public, but forced, coerced, involuntary quarantine is best to be as small as possible and typically requires an, an idea that, or a sense that the individual is likely to be infected and likely to pose a danger to other people. And that's just much more difficult to do on a large scale basis. One of, when do we cannot hear you? Oh, sorry. Um, one of the, we do keep getting these questions and I, I think it raises an interesting point that we tried to make clear in the book by, with a number of examples. Um, even in something as old as quarantine, there are still unsettled areas in the law and where the federal government could step in and close off the borders of the state. It remains a bit unsettled in the law. So that, so what we think about is you can look at sort of the, the basic legal foundations for the laws, but you also have to look at the public health goals. And if your goal is to prevent the spread of an epidemic, for example, the question is, how should it be done? So, this, this comes back, in, I think, to the notion of how you define the problem. And it's critically important it, how one defines the problem because that definition um, sets the scope and the set of the possible solution. So if you define your problem as we don't want people to leave the state, you may say, okay, then we're gonna have forcible stops. If you define the problem as we wanna keep people at home, to avoid spreading the disease. Then you, it opens up thinking about other alternatives, like making it possible for them to stay at home, um, making sure that they don't lose their income, et cetera. So that's, I think, an important point where law and public health come together, balancing the definition of the problem um, and identifying, therefore, the scope of possible solutions. I might add that if you take a look at every year, some of the major court decisions that are before the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court does not take that many decisions anymore. When you think about the number of cases that are litigated at the trial court level and then go to the courts of appeals at the federal level, and those that go up to, that are accepted to be heard, which the Supreme Court doesn't have to hear 
the cases that are asked, it is asked to hear. We have maybe what, 75, 80 cases that the Supreme Court might accept a year out of thousands. So when you think about some of the key seminal constitutional decisions issued by the Supreme Court, often they are public health issues. They are issues about the Second Amendment and gun control. They are issues about reproductive rights and the 14th and, and Fifth Amendments. Um, they are issues about um, the power of the government to require people to be covered by health insurance, as in NFIB against Sibelius with, with the ACA. These are astonishing, important, groundbreaking uh, Supreme Court decisions, and they are public health decisions. And I know that Professor Huberfeld has spoken a great deal about it. Or not. <laughs> Wendy, I'm sorry it cut out a second there. So if you were switching off to me, I, I missed the question. I apologize. <laughs> oh, well, I was just thinking if, if, if you want, if we want to think, if people think about constitutional law, legal issues as very exciting, but they don't think of them as public health issues. And yet, so many are. Uh, and so we are faced this year with multiple issues in public health that are um, in front of the United States Supreme Court, as we have actually in, in many years past. So it makes it exciting because what we provide in the book are sort of foundational ways of thinking about the um, about what constitutional law is. And as Michael says, it's not just a balancing of one against the other. There are um, different different weights, shall we say, to different rights. Some are more important than others, as, as Professor Ulrich said. There's sort of a hierarchy of rights that the United States Supreme Court has developed to weigh um, the, the importance of the right and the importance of the government interest. Uh, and yet, with each year, there are challenges to that sort of weighing system. And with a foundation of understanding how that operates, um, students and people interested in health policy have a better feel for how to evaluate possible new laws or possible challenges to laws um, by understanding what the odds are. Um, I, think it's, I think it's an important skill so that people don't uh, sort of take fruitless steps that will never have any action. And on the other hand, give them the analytic tools to uh, make the kind of change with the kind of persuasive argument that is necessary to make valuable change. Yeah, I think that's right. And I do think it is surprising uh, when you sit back and consider how many of the Supreme Court's decisions touch on public health, whether it's U.S. v. Lopez and regulation of firearms, whether it's U.S. v. Morrison and the Violence Against Women Act, domestic violence, women's participation in the economy and women's health, whether we're talking about cases like South Dakota versus Dole and the uh, congressional spending power, which is highway safety, right? Classic public health. Whether we're thinking about NFIB versus Sibelius and what the entire ACA means and the role of the ACA in ensuring people have access to health care, All of these cases are public health cases. And I think it's easy to forget that. We could even fold in USB Comstock and what it means to civilly detain a person who served their prison sentence, but may be a sexual predator, right? So we have, an incredible array of cases that help us to understand constitutional law. I think the harder question is whether courts are especially good at understanding the underlying health issues in these cases. Or whether they care. <laughs> so maybe I should jump in now um, and, and we can keep the conversation going. Uh, so it is, it is my task to introduce our third theme in the book, which is the idea that though government may have authority, it isn't the end of the story because every time we're trying to craft a legal response to a public health problem, we're making a set of choices that is derived from an incredible array of possibilities. So we're choosing which level of government is the best level of government to respond to a particular public health problem. Is it local government? Is it state government? Is it federal government? And then within federal government or state government, 
which branch of government should respond? Do we need a statute crafted by Congress or a state legislature? Do we need an executive action? What do we need? And then it goes beyond that because of course, as Professor Ulrich mentioned, we have to think about what individual rights are at stake anytime we craft any kind of legal response to a public health problem. There's always a tension between safety and security and individual rights, whether they're protected by the constitution, by common law or by statutes. And then of course, there's another question, which is whether or not we should involve private parties. Should we involve stakeholders? What role would they play if we're crafting a legal response to a public health issue or problem? So every time we choose a legal response, we have to select from this incredible grid of possibilities. And this grid is really reflective of the wide spectrum of possibility in laws that affect public health. We can choose from so many different kinds of legal actions to address any public health issue. And we have to also consider where the best action should be direct or indirect. Should we have direct regulation on the particular product we find undesirable? Should we have direct regulation of the people involved in the public health problem? Or should we try to influence behaviors through things like spending and taxes? And so when we're thinking about what kinds of legal responses are possible, I think it's helpful to remember we're not just talking about case law. So far, we've focused a fair amount on the idea that the, uh, the way the Supreme Court interprets laws is deeply important, the way the Supreme Court protects individual rights under the US Constitution is deeply important. And of course those things are true, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg. So we're not just talking about the role of the judiciary. We're not just talking about the role of the US Constitution. We also have to think about things like laws, statutes that are enacted by Congress or by state legislators. We have to think about regulations, which are the meat on the bones of the statute and is a response by whatever agency is the implementing agency for that statute to the power given to that agency. But even just regulations aren't enough. You have to think about sub-regulatory guidances, things like state Medicaid director letters or policy guidances that might be issued by agencies. We also have executive orders that come from the president that help those agencies to understand what their goals are in interpreting any particular law. Or as we're seeing right now, the president has a very particular role to play in declaring an emergency, which triggers the powers of particular agencies like FEMA, as well as enabling federal money to be drawn down by states. We also have common law on top of all of that. So we have this incredible spectrum of possibility when we're talking about any legal response to a public health issue. And the choices we make obviously are going to make or break our success in addressing that issue. But they're really hard questions because as I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And if we're considering what our best legal response is, the next question has to be, well, from what perspective? Is it the best policy response? Is there evidence to back up that response? Is it politically feasible? We don't know, it depends on what we're talking about. We have to know the subject matter, we have to know who the stakeholders are, we have to understand their perspectives. So let me give you just a couple of examples of what it means to make choices in legal responses. If we consider the Affordable Care Act, which has come up a couple of times in our conversation already, of course it just turned 10 a week ago today, so uh, happy 10th anniversary to the Affordable Care Act. The ACA had a unifying goal. The goal of the law, if we had to name one primary goal, was to achieve near universal insurance coverage. Of course, undocumented immigrants were left out of that scheme. But for the most part, we could say that universal insurance coverage was the goal of the law. Now, even though that was a unifying goal, the means were rather fragmented because the way that that goal is achieved was by building scaffolding around the existing foundation of laws that craft what we call our healthcare system, which is frankly not a system. And so to build on that existing foundation, we have this patchwork of laws that do things like create health insurance exchanges, create regulations that prevent pre-existing conditions from being the cause of exclusion from purchasing insurance. Eligibility for Medicaid was expanded. Each of these things is a different law that requires new regulations to respond to the law. And 
Each of these laws and their regulations, or many of them in any case, have been interpreted by courts as well because there have been so many legal challenges to the ACA. Even without those legal challenges, even if there were no judicial intervention in the Affordable Care Act, we would be looking at a federal law that creates serious baselines for understanding what it takes to create universal insurance coverage, but also a law that invites states to participate in the implementation of that federal goal. And when we invite states to participate, we are inviting variability into the outcomes. In other words, we know that there will be discrepancies in the ways that states treat their implementation of that law. And that's a choice we make. That is a major feature of many of our federal laws, that states are invited to participate in the implementation of the law. Often it's for good reasons. As Professor Ulrich and Professor Mariner said earlier, often we need those eyes on the ground, those local and state actors who know the nature of, in this instance, the pandemic and what it looks like to people operating on the ground. But if we're looking for universal baselines, involving states and localities isn't necessarily the best way to get there. And we see this variability in sharp relief right now during the coronavirus outbreak because, for example, only 12 states decided to take the lead in implementing their own health insurance exchanges under the Affordable Care Act. And those 12 states, of, of those 12 states, 11 have created special enrollment periods. Idaho is the holdout right now. So that people can decide to enroll under the special circumstances that are created by coronavirus and get health insurance coverage now, rather than having to wait for open enrollment in November. And so right there we see variability in the implementation of the law. Or if we consider the states that already implemented Medicaid expansion, 36 states and Washington DC have implemented expanded eligibility for Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, which means that those states had more stable health care systems in place because especially in rural areas, hospitals were less likely to close in those states. More people were covered by insurance, more people were experiencing greater financial stability, better ability to hold down jobs, fewer evictions in some instances, and the healthcare providers in those states were experiencing fewer patients who were uninsured and unable to pay. So there's a stability coming into a pandemic that comes from that unified effort. We could also consider the fragmented coronavirus response that we've been seeing as a result of our choices in crafting laws. It takes no fewer than four or five federal laws to get to the place where we are today. We have to trigger certain aspects of the Public Health Service Act. We had to trigger the Stafford Act, the National Emergencies Act, the Medicaid Act comes into play. All of these federal laws have different triggers that themselves make different policy responses possible. They depend on whether or not governors have asked for certain things. They depend on whether or not certain federal agencies are in play. We have a highly fragmented public health network and it makes it extremely difficult to respond to something like an epidemic or pandemic. And so when we're considering this highly local, highly fragmented public health non-system, it might be fine when we're talking about inspecting restaurants for cleanliness, but it isn't necessarily the best way to get there when we're talking about a public health emergency. As I said, this is just the tip of the iceberg, but one thing that we try to draw out in the book is that the choice of legal response reflects many, many things. And that doesn't just mean we're drawing on the best evidence or trying to craft the best policy, but sometimes it reflects two necessary political bargains, constitutional questions, protection of individual rights, and other factors. I'll stop there. Colleagues, I would, I would, I'm on. I would add, we certainly do have an enormously fragmented health system, and I include everything in that um, generic phrase. And of course, many students, even those who've grown up in it, uh, are still shocked to see how it is so different. But that's because we also live in a fragmented legal system. Uh, and that is just a, and a way this plays out. As you point out, 
There are often turf battles between the federal and state governments. Um, maybe perhaps <laughs> turf battles between the federal and state governments. And, and you could see it during Katrina when there was tension between the governor of Louisiana and the president of the United States and George W. Bush. You can see it in um, Trump's comment on publicly or tweet about thinking he would quarantine New York State and Governor Cuomo of New York said, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, this, you see it often and resolving those tensions uh, are both legal and political questions and pointing that out and being aware of it and how to work with it um, is an extremely important um, asset if you are working in the field of health policy. Yeah, I would just add another example is um, is the the variation in states in responding to to the current outbreak, right? When you think about um, Florida and the scenes of the spring breakers at the beach, <clears throat> you know they were not taking very strong action, and now recently they've said that they don't want anybody coming from New York, right? And so at first their actions are slow. Things like that. And next thing you know, it seems like they are blaming other states and saying that we feel like, you know, you're potentially the problem. It also comes from the feds, though then states are obviously all fighting for um, supplies and financial help. And last I read, um, Florida has gotten everything that they have asked for, despite perhaps uh, being slow on the uptake in terms of passing social distancing guidelines. Uh, whereas other states, for example, Massachusetts, I think has gotten 17% of what they've requested. And Trump has even said publicly that, you know, he wants states that are grateful and states that are, you know, helpful to the feds. And so I think that's another way of thinking about, as Professor Mariner said, the way that politics can play a part in sort of this interaction between the feds, between the feds and the states, or between the states themselves and which one of these policy levers ends up getting pulled or in what direction. To be clear, not all of those actions are legal. Just because they're happening does not mean they are legal. Exactly. Always a good point to remember. <laughs> uh, given and the time, should we turn it over to George so he can talk about the fourth theme? Sure. Our fourth theme is fairness and justice, or we call it justice and fairness. Uh, one of the things that uh, my colleagues and I, I did in the book and try to frame uh, the entire public health enterprise uh, under the rubric of human rights and suggest that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was proclaimed after World War II, probably the most uh, horrific event in, uh, in human history, uh, should be the code of ethics for public health, that all of the elements in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are foundational for health uh, as well. Uh, Article 1 is one we should remember now, uh, that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And so we have discussions now, you know, whose job should be covered by federal legislation, who, who should we make sure we, uh, we keep safe? Uh, do we care about undocumented immigrants? Or better than that, prisoners. So how, how do we take care of prisoners who are actually our responsibility and outside of people in emergency departments uh, are the only ones who have, quote, a right to health care uh, in the United States? Is that, are we serious about that? Do we, and, and what do we do if we have to, if we have to deal with them? Uh, in, in an emergency, and this certainly is, is a public health emergency. Uh, listening to my colleagues, one of the things uh, that I couldn't help but thinking is, uh, it's very common for people in public health to be asked, what's that? What's public health? What does that mean? No one asks that question in the middle of a pandemic. We know exactly what it means. It means trying to do the best we can to keep people healthy uh, and uh, uh, avoid, avoid a catastrophe. And I think we're seeing that collectively we're willing to do almost whatever it takes uh, to keep each other healthy. I don't 
know if this kind of solidarity, which is usually thought of as being European, although the Europeans don't seem in that much solidarity with each other now, uh, is going to last in the United States. But it strikes me like just after World War II, when we decided that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was the proper thing to do, that everyone uh, should have the same rights and everyone uh, should be treated equally, uh, that there's a chance. I mean, the other big event between that and now was 9-11, and that certainly triggered most of the laws that, that we've been talking about, uh, that there's a chance that uh, a new feeling of solidarity, a new feeling of responsibility for everyone, a new feeling that we're really all in this together uh, could grow out of this. Maybe that's being too optimistic. Um, but if it does, public health will be in the forefront of that because that is one of the few things uh, I think that Americans can agree on, that, uh, that health is a good and uh, we should try to at least make it possible for everyone to, uh, to live a healthy life uh, and, and that that's a good thing. Uh, there's tension, as a number of my colleagues already mentioned, between health and safety. Uh, we always talk about the police powers or the health and safety powers. Uh, I'm always more interested in the health part of that. Safety very quickly could go to national security and the police state. And it's been very heartening to me, and I'm sure lots of others, that nobody's talking about a police state. We're talking about quarantine states, but it's not serious talk. We know that's not talk. We're not sealing the borders, either the, the U.S. border, although we are trying to do that, um, or the borders between states. Uh, we are call, talking about calling off the, up the National Guard. We're only to do helpful things, only to build hospitals and to help uh, deliver supplies and, and do what I'd call peacetime activities, which, which is fine. No one wants, the, uh, wants to think of the National Guard out there doing soldier work. We want them to do real work helping people. So that, that's a good thing. That's, that's all good things. And I, and I want to underline what, what my colleagues have said, that just because you can do things and the government has an incredible power to do things in an emergency, doesn't mean you should do them. And, um, and that, that's really, really an important point. Uh, uh, we've had a lot of discussion lately about ventilators and some, I think, over the top discussion about how we're going to allocate ventilators. Who gets the next ventilator? Who decides? Is that a decision? that doctors should make? Is that a decision that we should have ethics committees make? Or who makes that decision? Hopefully we won't get to there, but, uh, but that's, uh, that's a hardcore public health question too, even though you can also look at it as a medical ethics and bioethics question. And at some point, all of these fields blend together, but I think the field that holds them together uh, is public health. We did, by the way, just to mention it, uh, deal in detail with all hazards preparedness, uh, with the uh, experience we've had under the 1918 uh, flu, uh, with uh, smallpox under 9-11 uh, as a weapon, uh, with, uh, with the Ebola crisis, uh, and with SARS. Those are all dealt with uh, in the book, and I think well, and we tried to figure out what lessons we draw from them. And uh, one lesson we didn't draw is that we should always be prepared for what's coming next. And Americans are real, not every, everybody's really, really not very good at that. There's probably no place in the world that was prepared, with the possible exception of, of, of Singapore, but we don't know enough about Singapore. I'll leave it there because I want to get involved with questions. So uh, let me, uh, I'm actually going to uh, then uh, try to uh, sort some of the questions that are coming from the audience. And uh, okay. just, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, encourage the audience to use the Q&A um, uh, panel for uh, questions. Some people are also sending them through chat. If you send them all through Q&A, it's a little bit easier um, uh, to triage these. Um, before I turn to some of the audience questions, I want to ask, take a moderator prerogative and ask you all one question, if you don't mind. So um, at this moment in time, um, you just published this book. And uh, then, of course, a global pandemic happens. So if you were to do an edition again tomorrow, which you won't because these things are a lot of work, um, uh, what, what issues would you fore foreground more? And uh, 
and you know, I'm asking that question operationally to ask what are going to be the big issues that we as a society are going to need to deal with. These are obviously not new issues, but what would be foreground more now that we need to grapple with in the coming years for anybody really? Didn't Yogi Berra say that prediction is difficult, especially about the future? It is. Uh, Either Yogi Berra or Niels Bohr, I'm clear who said that. <laughs> or um, Nostradamus usually gets that one, yes. All right. Uh, I'm going to venture a statement that I, I throw out to my colleagues. I don't think we change a lot. I think we could add uh, clear references to this pandemic, but the ways of thinking about responding to it, I think, are in the book. And indeed, uh, earlier administrations had put forth plans, including the Obama administration, and indeed the Trump administration tried its own um, tabletop exercise about this kind of a pandemic, not that it necessarily ever made it to um, the, uh, the upper regions of officialdom in the administration, according to the New York Times. So it's not clear to me that there would be a dramatic change. And part of the reason for that is because we wanted a book that lasted. So we look at the foundational legal principles and then at, enable people to grapple with how they are evolving. We certainly provide examples, for, for example, in, in the constitutional areas of how um, constitutional principles developed, how they are changing, and provide um, uh, problems and examples that students can grapple with in, in applying things so they know they have the tools to deal with new conditions. I, I hope that they can. I, I welcome my colleagues' comments. I'm certainly not gonna contradict that. <laughs> Nicole or Michael? I, I agree with Wendy. I, I do think that the way we've approached the book gives everyone the right foundations for understanding how this operates and what the key issues are. I, I think one thing that's been a challenge for me uh, professionally in this moment is keeping track of all of the different levers of power that can be pulled. And I think I might like to think through a way to teach that um, or to make it clear for people who are not experts in the field, because there are so many laws that have to come into play to make all of this operationalize. Um, but that's a fairly specific answer in terms of the structure of the book. I actually do think it gives you what you need for the most part to, to make your way through this. Yeah, I was, sorry, I just wanted to add on. Yeah, I, I think this is, it highlights sort of an important part of the switch from here is an epidemic and emergency preparedness chapter where in when there's no epidemic, people tend to not care or think that that's very important. Whereas right now, things like federalism, individual rights, government authority, all of those things are relevant and important. And we have all of that stuff in the book on those specific topics. And so they can be applied rather than having it sort of be topic specific. Thank you. I'm going to jump to some audience questions because we have a lot of audience questions. I want to get to some of them. I'm going to paraphrase. So let me start and I'll let the panelists decide who best answers these themselves. Okay. Let me start paraphrasing a question. So one of, the, one of the challenges that the current moment holds is the challenge of weighing uh, the cost of some of the mitigation efforts, particularly as they affect those who are most vulnerable, hourly wage workers, people who are unstably housed, etc. So what does, what does the, what, what, what does health law, and perhaps as it's intersecting with human rights, teach us about how we can better weigh some of these, the consequences of the consequences and the actions that we are taking to mitigate the viral spread? Well, it teaches, I think it teaches us that we should, instead of uh, caring for them or thinking about them last, we should be thinking about the most vulnerable people first, because they're really the ones who are at most at risk. I mean, we're all at risk for getting a virus, obviously, but uh, for most of us are healthy enough that we'll not just survive it, we'll be fine with it. Um, many, 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 many people, not just homeless people, not just prisoners, not just undocumented immigrants, but many poor people uh, are much less likely to survive. And I think therefore, 
uh, deserve our, uh, actually require our help and should be prioritized when we're doing it. So George, if I may push on that. Um, of course. Uh, let, let, let's say that's the answer. The answer is that actually we need to think about the vulnerable first. And, and I actually think I agree with that. Um, what, what concretely um, um, should we have done differently in the, in the moment that, uh, than what we have done so far? At any level, federal, state, I'm, I'm actually curious for illustrative purposes. Okay, well, just, just one uh, relatively simple thing is, well, it's not that simple, it's complicated, is to let as many people out of our prisons and jails, which are going to be hotbeds of this uh, virus at, at sometime soon, uh, as we can. Certainly, nonviolent prisoners. I mean, we have way too many people in prison anyway. We know that. We got more people in any other country in the world. And this is an opportunity both to help them uh, avoid getting the virus, but also to do the right thing, which is to cut down our number of prisoners. Uh, I, uh... And, no, I agree with that. That's, an, that's really interesting. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to jump ahead to the next, next question. So uh, the, the question is, uh, the discussion of Trump's arbitrary allocation of life-saving supplies shows what happens when someone who neither knows nor cares, says the, says the question, about the public is in charge. Um, um, so the question is this. Is there a way to shield public health agencies like CDC and FDA from the arbitrary exercise of power by presidential authorities for anybody? So the answer to that is no. <laughs> but I'd like to hear my colleagues talk more in more depth about this. Well, the, the power that's being exercised is largely political, not legal. Exactly. And apart from the power to appoint the person in charge and the power to fire the person in charge, um, there are some legal protections within statutes that, the, that, that describe what the agencies can and cannot do, but you have to pay attention to who's in charge. And that comes down to elections. Hmm. That's really interesting. Let me ask a different question. Um, um, so uh, let's talk about the responsibility of public health law to be more proactive than reactive. So the questioner says, I'm thinking specifically about phys physician shortage, which is in the headlines right now, and then problems due to over-specialization to the extent that we have probably more dermatologists than we need and far fewer primary care physicians than we need. So to this extent, the physician shortage is manufactured. I think it's a good point. Um, so does public health law have a responsibility to find a way to address such issues, which are, would be extremely unpopular with the healthcare profession? And I would add, how can it actually exercise that responsibility? So this is a question that comes up somewhat regularly. And I think it's an uncomfortable one for us because it requires acknowledging that we pay for stuff and we pay for extra learning, but we don't necessarily pay for thinking in the way that we reimburse healthcare services. And if you think about it, primary care physicians are frontline defense where a patient comes in, has a set of symptoms that they may or may not be able to describe eloquently. And the job of the primary care physician is to be a detective and to figure out what the problem may be. And that's thinking. It's not necessarily a particular service. Diagnosis in that circumstance is a kind of payment for thinking. And there are other systems that have chosen to pay for that much better than we do. And until we change the way that we pay our frontline problem solving thinkers, i.e. primary care physicians, and those who we, I think, somewhat unfortunately call physician extenders, like nurse practitioners and physician assistants, and those who can provide a lot of the primary care services that many people need, until we choose to pay them differently, I think we're gonna to continue to see this skewing towards certain specialties. But I also think there's a factor here that a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about, which is physician burnout, and whether it's worth it to be on the front line and not be paid as well as your colleagues, and to be seeing too many patients and be under pressure from uh, all of the various different kinds of payers in our system. The fragmentation of our system has costs, and one of them is reluctance to be a primary care physician. 
Anybody yep. want to add? I'd add just, just one small point. Uh, that we have a legal system that leaves the choice of occupation to individuals without government interference. Yes, That's we our do. Baseline. That's our default system. And um, therefore, as a result, people will choose jobs that they feel they want to do, they want to learn about, and presumably that pay them well. Now, that leaves out a whole swath of society that really have very little choice in what jobs they can do. And I'm not talking only about undocumented immigrants. I'm talking about people who uh, are not part of the better educated uh, groups of people. But still, the notion that people can choose their own jobs will leave us subject to, uh, to, to choice. And unless there may be legal tools, we could say, no, we are going to, um, we're going to limit the number of physicians who can go into dermatology or orthopedics or what have you, uh, if, if we wish to. That's, a, that's, again, a political choice. One of which clearly we're not making. Um, we're trying to use financial incentives or we're trying to use uh, encouragement among uh, residencies and accreditation groups. One of the things that I, I actually want to point out in case no one else is, has an opportunity to mention it, is that um, this book doesn't take political positions. It compares law with politics. It points out the implications of the different choices. But unlike a lot of texts that are designed to be persuasive, that are designed to be advocacy as opposed to scholarship, um, we try and lay out all, all points of view, and in particular, how to critically analyze them using essentially a public health perspective, which is evaluate the evidence, look at the implications, see where it goes, and what are the results for public health. And that's, I think, um, may make it somewhat unique in this field. Um, let me move to a different question. There's a couple of questions about the um, equity justice aspects of scarce resor resource allocation, like ventilators at this moment in time. And there's a question that's specific, which I think can help be illustrative for all of us. How would you respond to the story that Alabama's plan, people with, quote, severe or profound mental retardation, as well as, quote, moderate to severe dementia, should be considered unlikely candidates for ventilator support during a period of rationing? George, are, are, are you going to take this? I guess George, I am. George was, has written the seminal works on this, so I think that he, he, he should be res the responsible. Over to you, Professor Ennis. I mean, it's, a, it's always a hypothetical, but sometimes it may happen that, uh, you know, you actually don't have enough ventilators for everybody. Uh, and then the question is, how do you decide who gets them and who doesn't? Uh, I think one way you don't decide is to say, well, the mentally retarded uh, people with, with dementia aren't going to get them, unless you're going to say they don't, aren't going to get any treatment. And you might want to, some people would, would say that, but that's, obviously gross violation of human rights. You can't make decisions uh, about treatment on the basis of arbitrary uh, characteristics of people, whether it's race, religion, national origin, uh, or disability. I mean, you just, you can't do that. You have to have come up with a better one. Now the better one, they're gonna say, well, no, it's not that they're disabled, it's that they're not able to follow instructions, uh, that they're not able uh, to take care of themselves. So they're gonna be less likely to survive after they get off the ventilator, assuming they ever do get off the ventilator. Uh, and if that's true, and you really do have a limited number of ventilators, that is, you know, your outcome, your, your possible outcome is a, a legitimate thing to consider. You know, so it's a very hard question, but that's a, that's the answer to that, you don't make them based on uh, your IQ, for example, that's just ridiculous. Or your age, <laughs> since I'm getting older now, I'm more attuned to that. Uh, but I don't think you can make them on the basis of age either. I think you can't use any one criteria. You've got to use some kind of legitimate medical uh, prognosis uh, if you're going to make choices. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to move on. Um, this is actually a question specifically for Professor Huberfeld, it's, and it's from an incoming MPH candidate, so I'm going to prioritize it over others. Um, my question is, you mentioned balancing between blanket definition of public health problems versus conservative and target definitions of public health. Uh, what would you say about those individuals in low risk populations being 
um, subject to unstable or insecure jobs during this pandemic? What is a, a possible solution to manage high and low risk populations without creating disruptions with job and income, income security? Well, how long do we have? <laughs> that question is everything, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great question. I think that one of the things that we should be learning from this experience is that it is somewhat difficult to decide who's high risk and who's low risk. This virus is new to humans, and one of the jobs of public health is to help us figure out who is at the most risk. And it seems like that's dictated by a variety of different factors, and those factors keep changing. And so I think the second part of the question was, depending on what kind of risk you have, should your job be protected? Am I hearing that right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 to me, the, whether your job is protected isn't defined by whether you're high risk or low risk, but the fact that in the United States, we still lack serious job protections for people who need to leave work for a variety of reasons whether it's to care for a loved one, to give birth to a child, to take care of themselves during a medical crisis, whatever the factors may be, we're not especially good with medical leave, disability leave, uh, you know, <laughs> childbirth leave, and none of those things are particularly robust in the United States. And if we were to take a broader view of what's possible in terms of protecting work, we would see, I think, that it's valuable to protect work for everyone, not just people who are in particular populations. I often talk with my class about the difference between equality and equitability. And I think that the, one of the easiest ways to envision this is to think about a very simple example, which is, let's say I'm five feet tall and you're six feet tall and we both wanna look over a seven foot fence. I need a two foot tall ladder to do that and you need a one foot tall ladder to do that. Do I not get a higher ladder to see over the same fence? We both have legitimate goals. We both wanna look over the same fence, but if we were treated equally, I could still not see over the fence. So I think it's helpful to think in terms of equitability and not just equality in these circumstances, because when we start talking about equality, we actually end up with big differences. You could think about the stimulus package, right? Do people who earn a certain amount of money need $1,200 from the federal government if their jobs are secure, they still have salaried income? Or would that money be better given to families that are going to have complete loss of uh, wages, going to lose their employment benefits, are going to have housing instability as a result? Maybe the money would be better filtered in that direction. So again, the difference between equality and equitability, I think, is really important for evaluating how we address the particular public health problem. Thank you. Go a different question now. Um, I want to know why she wants to look over the fence. <laughs> Don't you want to know? <laughs> um, the uh, concept of um, of uh, advertising as a public health influencer, which uh, which uh, was mentioned in, in your comments, um, and uh, in the comments you touched on individual rights. Can you also talk about the rights of corporations and how that balances against individual rights and maybe using advertising as an example? Professor Marin, would you like to take that? <laughs> I'll start. Um... Yeah, as uh, I think Justice Sotomayor said, in this day and age, the First Amendment is being weaponized uh, to protect corporations much more than they had been in the past. Uh, we think of the First Amendment as protecting freedom of speech and freedom of religion, and uh, it has been recently used to protect prerogatives of corporations that uh, claim to have religious views against certain kinds of employees or certain kinds of benefits, um, also by corporations who claim um, the, the prerogative to provide kinds of advertising that can't be restricted by government, and also to restrict government from forcing uh, organizations like the like like some of these. Uh, so-called crisis pregnancy centers from disclosing that they don't provide medical care and certainly don't provide uh, abortions. So this is a highly fraught area of constitutional law and the growing recognition of First Amendment protection of corporate decision-making is, is something that is um, 
changing the landscape of our society in general and public health efforts in particular. Thank you. Let me go to a different question altogether. Um, um, maybe Professor Ulrich, you can take this one. Um, uh, the, um, the process of defining essential services. How does the law differentiate between essential services, toy store versus a gun shop or a smoke shop? I'm using the questioner's questions. And, um, and, and to what extent does, do the repercussions of defining these as essential services influence the definition itself? Yeah, I, I, it's a good question. Um, at, you know, uh, my colleagues can jump in if they have something to add, but I, I think right now we don't know. That is, is unfortunately the answer. Um, so the area that I've been sort of trying to track a little bit is this issue of the gun shops. And in Texas, they said that they weren't essential at first. Then some people complained, there were some potential lawsuits, and they asked the attorney general of the state to say, okay, are they essential? Do, does the Second Amendment require that they be open? And eventually the, the AG for Texas said yes. Um, in Pennsylvania, they said no. They were sued. There was a state Supreme Court um, per curiam opinion that said they're not essential, uh, but there was a dissent. And then the governor of Pennsylvania changed his mind and said that they were essential later. Um, so right now, it appears as though states have um, authority to decide what is essential and what is not. Um, but what the criteria is, I think it's supposed to, you know, it, it appears to be related to things like food, health care, you know, uh, oddly enough, these things that we would consider, you know, some basic and, and critical uh, human rights. Um, but now we see that it's starting to expand. There's starting to be debates over whether things like gun stores, abortion clinics, um, things like that uh, qualify. And, and until a court weighs in to determine whether there is some constitutional way to make that determination, um, we don't really know at the moment. Thank you. Let me ask you a different question. And I'm, I'm not sure um, if um, uh, who will answer this one, but. Uh, could inaction to respond to the spread of COVID in jails, prisons be a violation of the Eighth Amendment? And then there's a corollary to this, which I think is actually interesting. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion about early release right now. To what extent should one balance the imperative for early release with the fact that if you don't have proper transitional services or not have housing for people who are released, it actually makes them worse off? I like this question very much. I want to know the answer. No, <laughs> it's a great question, right? Uh, I mean, first of all, yeah, there is a, you cannot be deliberately indifferent to a, uh, a prisoner's health. And it seems to me uh, without making provisions to try to make sure no prisoner gets the, gets the virus, you're being indifferent because it's not, uh, it's not uh, something that the prisoner has any control over. Uh, but your second part of that question is really good because we don't have good transitional services. And are we making the prisoners' life worse by letting them out now without a place to a place to go? And the answer is yes to that. So I think we have to figure out how to get them at least temporary housing when they when they get out of out of prison. Otherwise, yeah, what are you letting them go for? You know, yeah. Well, and you don't want to use that as a justification for holding people indefinitely beyond you know when they're allowed to be held either. No, of course not. Of course not. Because, uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that we treat prisoners horribly now is not an excuse uh, not, to, not to let them go. That's true. Unless you think they're dangerous. But we're really talking about non-dangerous prisoners, which are most of them. I'm going to do a bit of uh, push a few more questions to get them in, uh, in the next few minutes. Um, maybe Professor Huberfeld, maybe this is, you can address this. It's a little bit outside of the scope of the book, but I think it's germane to your last answer and to the moment. Can you talk briefly because I know you can talk for hours about this, on the equitability of the current stimulus package that was just passed. Wow. <laughs> I uh, I'm glad you're laughing. That's good, yeah. Very briefly, very briefly. it is, um, I think it represents a lot of political compromises. And I think that if the reporting is true, there was a worse version of this 
stimulus package on the table that did things like would have uh, made people ineligible for Medicaid if their unemployment benefits pushed them above the eligibility, financial eligibility limits for Medicaid, and that was dropped. So I temper my answer with an understanding that it could have been less equitable. I do not think it is an especially equitable stimulus package. And I think it reflects a belief in trickle-down economics that has been disproven by many, many economists over time, but that persists in our politics. I do think it's important that there are features of it that will help people get some kind of money in their pocket while they're losing their jobs and their housing is unstable. But I think we're seeing a lot of those remedies are not just coming from the stimulus package, but from local governments making decisions such as preventing evictions in this time. So my short answer is I do not think that the stimulus package is particularly equitable. I think it's more focused on corporate needs than individual needs. Thank you. Um, um, separate question, maybe Professor Mariners for you. Can you uh, comment on the uh, constitutionality of governors closing state and commonwealth borders? Wendy, I, I think you're on mute. Yes, <sighs> deliberately. Uh, <laughs> okay, I thought you might. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there, there are certain limitations on whether states have uh, can close their borders to other states. After all, um, there is free travel across the United States that is protected by the Constitution, and states can't discriminate against other states, uh, with very rare exceptions. So I, I think that the answer to that is generally no, but um, it may be fair, it may be fair to ask people to submit to some kind of medical evaluation to see if they, um, if they should be treated and take care of themselves or stay safely elsewhere. We're facing that. Uh, Martha's Vineyard, of all places, asked anyone coming from New York or New Jersey or Connecticut, people are fleeing to second homes there to hide out, um, to, uh, to self-quarantine. I hate that word. I'm sorry, it's not a legal term. But to stay at home uh, in, in, for 14 days to determine whether or not they might be infected, which is an interesting notion. <laughs> Um, let me ask one other question, and then I'm going to do a lightning round as we conclude. Um, um, the question is an interesting question. Um, when you have bordering states, are there examples of bordering states right now, which with sort of similar stage in the pandemic, um, that have taken significantly different measures? So th does that have implications for states' capacity to enforce those measures? If, if states, they don't have to be bordering, but let me paraphrase a little bit. If states that are in roughly similar stage of the epidemic, but they take significantly different measures. Does that, from a legal point of view, represent a challenge to the extent to which that's enforceable? You could look at Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia as an example. Um, that trio of states are having very different responses. Right now, Kentucky has a stay-at-home order from the governor. Uh, Tennessee has, I think, some cities that are enforcing stay-at-home orders, and Virginia has no statewide order, last I checked. Um, and so they would each be a different sort of color if you were trying to map it out. And these borders are porous. These, their borders are in rural areas and people could hop on a highway and drive anywhere they wanted to. And it absolutely has an impact on how we can contain the pandemic, what these states are up to, which is part of the problem with not having sort of a uniform sense of how to deal with the, the pandemic. Uh, we could even look at Massachusetts and New Hampshire, right? Massachusetts and New Hampshire are in wildly different places right now, but we share borders and people cross that border for healthcare all the time. Yeah. No, I think it's a, it's a great answer. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to do a, one last question for all the panelists and maybe we can go through in sequence. Um, um, and this ties back into predicting the future, but I'm going to ask if, if, if I may. Um, um, given where we are now, I mean, you four are the experts on public health law. What is going to be the most important issue in public health law in coming years? Professor Mariner. I'd like to say making the population resilient and um, putting much of what has been done in the stimulus package into permanent 
but I actually worry that it's um, the First Amendment protection of religion that has permeated a, a large number of overall policies and has shifted the way in which uh, organizations operate and has, I think, in many respects, challenged the civil liberties of much of our population. So you think that's going to rise in the next couple of years as, as, as becoming the, the issue that we're most contending with as a country? Sorry, you're on mute. You're on mute for me. But one of the things that's quite interesting is um, how what is old is new again. And uh, certainly with respect to epidemics and quarantine, you're seeing it now. Um, civil commitment issues that we dropped out of teaching quite a few years ago had roared back. Uh, religion didn't teach it for quite a few years just to save class time. Now it's huge. So I, I think so. That in the First Amendment, uh, the rest of the First Amendment. Thank you. Professor Ulrich. Yeah, I, I think, uh, and maybe this answer is a little ambiguous, but um, I think getting the judiciary to find and see health as a legal and constitutional value. Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about already on this panel is all of these cases that actually are public health law cases. And we see them that way, be, in part at least because we are public health um, professionals. But as uh, at least Professor Huberfeld said earlier, the courts don't typically describe or think of them that way. And so I think getting whether or not we can get the court to start to think about Second Amendment right cases as public health cases, Medicaid cases and spending power and commerce and um, First Amendment speech and, and religion as having an impact on health and that not being the only thing that should be looked at, but a critical and important thing to be looked at, I think is really going to um, have a big impact in the future. Thank you. Professor Huberfeld. Unsurprisingly, I'm struggling with choosing one thing. Uh, <laughs> but if I had to choose one thing, I think it would be a plea that we stop treating health as a transaction. I think too much of where the law is reflects the private law, contract-based, transactional, cash-in-pocket orientation of health and healthcare in this country for the last century or more. And I think we need to deeply interrogate that default. Thank you. Professor Ennis. Uh, maybe surprisingly, I think the big challenge is going to be the nature of the corporation and uh, try to beat back the Supreme Court's view that corporations are people too, that they have uh, religious rights, they have free speech rights, and that money equals free speech, and that uh, that's going to destroy our democracy and our public health. We've got to fight that. Well, those are, uh, those are four really interesting answers. Um, um, I want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you for um, writing this book. Thank you for uh, everything you do to actually make, elevate issues of uh, health law, policy, human rights, and ethics. Um, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I want to say thank you to everybody who joined us both on Zoom as well as on uh, Facebook Live. And uh, thank you for uh, what uh, turned out to be a really most interesting and timely conversation. Thank you. Have thank you so day. much. Thanks thank to you. everybody who joined us. Thank you. Yes, thanks to all of you out there. Thanks. Thank you.